Hi there and welcome to this video which is going to run through a historical timeline of astrophysics. It's going to look at the pioneers who actually paved the way to give us an understanding of how the cosmos really looks. It also will highlight some of the technologies that we utilised to gather the data which allowed them to draw their conclusions. So basically we can go back to the beginning of time when man looked up to the heavens and asked the question, what is out there? There are many different views going back to Babylon and China. This gives us a snippet of views of how people gave stories around the cosmos. This was taken from The Lion King, run by Disney. It's a moon. Yeah. Ever wonder what those sparkly dots are up there? I don't wonder. I know. Oh, what are they? They're fireflies. Fireflies that got stuck up in that big bluish black thing. Oh, gee. I always thought they were balls of gas burning billions of miles away. Pumba, with you, everything's gas. Simba, what do you think? Well, I don't know. Oh, come well, on, well, give, come give, on, give, Simba, give, come on. Give, come on. Give, come on. Uh, flowers, give. please. Well, give. Somebody once told me that the great kings of the past are up there, watching over us. Really? Mean a bunch of royal dead guys are watching us? <laughs> Although this is Disney's version, it's not far from the truth as to how people try to explain the heavens. They put stories together which entertained but also had an element of truth. One of the first recognized um, pioneers was put forward by Aristotle. He lived in northern Greece in a place called Stagri Stagira. He put forward the idea given by Pythagoras that the shape of the earth and moon was, was a sphere and he stated the sphere is a perfect solid and the heavens are a region of perfection. The earth's component pieces falling naturally towards the earth would press into a round form. In an eclipse of the moon, the earth's shadow is always circular. A flat disk would cast an oval shape, hence the idea of the sphere. Even in short travels northwards, the pole star is always higher in the sky. So Aristotle tried to put forward his idea of this spherical um, object that we weren't flat. Now if you think about that and the idea of early sailors that the earth was flat and if you sailed to the end of the earth you would fall off. This isn't too far from the truth. Quite an extreme um, uh, idea to put forward considering the time at which Aristotle was around. The next pioneer that we look at is Aristarchus of Samoa, again an ancient Greek astronomer and a mathematician who put forward the first known model of a sun-centered universe and that the stars were bodies like the sun. These went against the theories of Aristotle who stated it an incorrect earth-centered model. But you'd be amazed how Aristotle's idea was accepted by um, early pioneers and it was nearly 18 centuries before Aristarchus's idea was actually um, taken on board and uh, looked into in a, in a lot more um, detail. Another person who was um, responsible for our knowledge of the, um, the earth was Eratosthenes. Again, he was a Greek from Styrene who calculated the circumference of the earth applying mathematical measurements. He used shadows and geometry to extrapolate distances and thus calculated the Earth's circumference. Hipparchus then came on in um, 190 to 120 BC. He was born in um, Nicaea, Bithynia, Turkey, and basically is the founder of modern trigonometry. Now basically these laws of trigonometry allow us to actually utilize and measure distances and determine distances that allows us to look at angles, and how far away certain objects are. So he's classified as a pioneer with respect to um, astrophysics because he gave us the tools which allowed it to measure the heavens. Next person we're going to look at is Ptolemy, 90 AD. 90 AD. Again, he was an Egyptian um, astronomer who put forward again the idea of an Earth-centered universe with the stars forming the, the backdrop. Now this is going back to Aristotle's idea. His hand-drawn model is shown here. Now you can see here that we've got the Earth in the center 
and it goes with a backdrop of the stars. Then we've got the planets which are moving outwards. The bottom right hand corner shows us a little bit more um, simplified the version that we that we see um, in the in the hand drawn uh, version. The idea being that as the Earth spins, the uh, as the Earth stays stationary, the stars then move around us. Hence, that's why we see the stars at different periods of the year and different constellations. The planets then move within these these areas. So this was actually um, accepted for a long, long time. Basically, why else would um, the Earth be anywhere else? Why, why should it um, not be the center of the universe? And remember that you've got to take into account that a lot of these, um, these early pioneers followed the gods. And the gods basically were looking down on Earth. They created Earth. They created man. And as a result, they, they put um, the, the gods would surely put the Earth at the center because that's one of their creations. So although we, we seem to understand that we go around the sun, you've got to take your mind back as to what it would be like if um, we, we had no idea. So this is not as far-fetched as you may seem. The next person we're going to look at is Copernicus. Now he was um, basically a, a clerk in um, Poland, and he put forward the idea, the model of the universe from Aristarchus, that it was a sun-centered solar system. However, his model was incredibly difficult to decipher and consisted of many different circles. And again, we, we can see um, a model in the top right-hand corner, but the um, simplified version is a lot more easy to understand. There you can see we've got a sun center, and then the planets move out, and then we've got motionless stars in the distance, with the idea that the Earth and all the planets actually move around the stars. Now, this is a lot more um, similar to what we, uh, we understand today, but at the time of Copernicus, this is like a major thing to state, because remember, we're, we're li living in a, an age at that time where religion was very, very important, and um, basically everybody believed that God put us in, in um, one position, which allowed uh, the planets to revolve around us. So, next we look at uh, Tycho Brahe. Now, Tycho Brahe was a um, very eccentric scientist, um, and basically he was a, an astronomer. He went to Prague, and he worked for the emperor in Prague as his astrologer. Now, don't get confused between astrology and astronomy. Astrology is basically looking at how the planets um, align themselves to govern the future, whereas astronomy is more of a process of looking at the heavens and trying to decipher what's going on. So anyway, Tycho um, Brahe went to Prague and he worked for the emperor as his astrologer and it gave him the opportunity to have money which allowed him to observe the stars. Although a little eccentric, he was an excellent data collector. He mapped the position of the stars to great um, detail and throughout the night using his quadrant, which you can see here. Now what he did was the arm that you can see, which is pointing around about 45 degrees, was pointing towards the various stars, and then he used the arc to measure the distances um, and the angles that those, plant, those stars happened to be throughout the night. Now he had extensive data, which allowed us to um, then utilize that data to come up with a, a conclusion. Now, it was later on, or, or towards the latter part of his life, that Johannes Kepler, who was born in Germany and a, and a mathematician, came and worked for Brahe. Now, um, it wasn't so, so long after um, uh, Brahe died that um, at one of his famous parties, apparently he, uh, the, the story goes that he got drunk and um, he had a three-day party and he got drunk and decided not to go to the toilet and his actual bladder um, exploded, although whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But at this time, Kepler was uh, one of his assistants, and again the story goes that Brahe really didn't like much of Kepler um, and kept him away from a lot of his data. But when he died, Kepler got hold of this data, and um, he spent the next few years trying to make sense of the Mars loop. Now the Mars loop can be seen here, and what it was was um, the fact that through um, Brahe's data, 
Mars seemed to take a backward to journey away from us and then started to accelerate. So you can see that this loop has been generated. Now this has perplexed um, the Greeks for a long, long time up to this point. They observed this but couldn't put a reason behind it. Now the Greeks really um, loved circles. They tried to put everything into a circular model. Now, um, as a result, because of their, their early history and what have you, everybody accepted that there must have been some circular motion. So there's Bra uh, Kepler looking at Brahe's data, and he accepted that, that uh, Brahe's data must be correct. Now, again, the story goes that um, he decided after about um, five years or so that he couldn't make Mars loop or couldn't get Mars loop to be explained. And so what he did, um, he threw out all his conclusions, went back to the basics, and instead of using a circular model, he started dealing with other shapes. And from this, he found a shape that actually made sense, and that was the ellipse. And from this, he produced three main laws. Um, the most profound of these laws was the, the ellipse, but he also looked at area and period. And the, the idea that as the planets move around the sun in an ellipse, they, they change um, their speed. But the time period going between various areas was the same as they, as they covered a certain area. So there was a link between area and time period and, and speed. So now we've got this idea that has explained Mars loop. Um, Mars loop, as I say, was this observation that the Greeks had picked up way before Christ. Um, but couldn't explain it. They, they wanted to work with circles, but Kepler said now that we were, we were having planetary orbits, which basically went into um, ellipses. Now, at the same time, um, in Italy, Galileo Galilei was um, developing his first telescope. He was an astronomer, um, basically wasn't really going anywhere, and he heard this idea of um, a Dutch spyglass um, it came, a, a person came to uh, Venice and uh, was talking about the spyglass and he thought this was a really good idea. And what he did, he went, and went to um, Marino and got some glass, he got an organ pipe and he made his first telescope. And here's a picture of his telescope here. Now, the idea behind the uh, telescope was um, it was going to be a really good tool for magnifying um, objects. Now here's our first idea of technology, well probably our second idea of technology if we look at Tycho Brahe's quadrant, but this telescope was used to magnify objects which are far away. Now this was great for Venice because um, it lives on, it's on the sea and um, high, um, very big trading area, so as a result um, it was open for attack by pirates. So using the uh, telescope, um, Galileo was able to pr to give a couple of hours of um, time when new ships or, or invading ships could come in so they could man their defences. But then Galileo started looking up to the heavens and he started using his telescope to gather data of um, the heavens and what was, what was going on up there. And from this, he was able to get some detailed pictures of um, the moon. And here's, a, here's an idea of what he produced. These are his drawings through his telescope of the moon, and you can see all the craters and you know, beautiful pictures that were created. Now, he wrote his first book that was a huge success and, and, and virtually made him famous. Um, and, but then after writing his second book, he uh, pushed the idea of a sun-centered universe. Now, this was all going on during the time in history of the Reformation. This went against the views of the church and lost the church some form of um, power. So he was found guilty of sedition and put under house arrest. And it wasn't until well after his death that his theory was realized of this sun-centered um, universe, which he, he uh, pushed for. However, for his groundwork in science investigation and his idea of gathering data and then drawing conclusions, he's now named the father of science. So our next um, pioneer is uh, Christian Huygens. Now he's a Dutch physicist, mathematician and astronomer, and he was renowned for using telescopic evidence of the rings of, of, for the rings of Saturn and discovered one of its moons, which is Titan, which you can see here. Our next scientist is Ole Roma. Now he was a Danish astronomer 
who was able to determine the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. He compared the duration of Io's orbits as Earth moved towards Jupiter and then moved away over a six month period. By doing a comparison between the uh, changes in speed due to these eclipses, which is apparently around about 11.2 minutes, he was able to work out not only the distance that we were moving, and he related that distance to the speed at which light had to travel at any one point. So as a result, he came up with this, um, this figure for the speed of light. Now, this is within 20% of what it actually is today, which is pretty damn good considering the time period that Roma was, was dealing with. Now, the, currently, the sun-centered model had been accepted. We know that Kepler's laws stated that planetary movement was in, was in an ellipse and that the speed changed as the planets approached the sun. Galileo produced an instrument that helped astronomers observe the planets and stars. However, no one could explain what held the planets in their motion around the sun. And it was down to Isaac Newton, an English mathematician and physicist, who proposed the theory of gravity, being this magical force that held the planets in their orbits. Isaac Newton is famous for promoting three laws of motion as well as proposing theories of light and calculus, which he published in his famous book, The Principia. This revolutionized our understanding of planetary moment, mo movement. More of um, Newton will be studied um, throughout this um, iTunes U post. Much later on, our, our next big um, astronomer is Edwin Hubble. He was an American who proposed the expansion of the universe from a specific point. His theories then led to evidence to back up the theory of the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. For his huge contribution um, to astronomy, his name was given to the, te the Hubble telescope. And we can see the Hubble telescope here. And this sits outside our, um, our atmosphere and takes incredibly clear pictures of our current cosmos, as you can see surrounding this image here. Lots of people think he invented the Hubble telescope, but unfortunately not. Now, now the um, uh, and NASA have put out another big telescope, um, the J Webb telescope, which basically can look um, into space a lot more, a lot deeper. So finally, our, our next major astronomer obviously is Stephen Hawking. He's an English theoretical physicist who has proposed theories about black holes in his book and promoted further evidence for the idea of the Big Bang. He's also worked on continuation of Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. And so basically our um, understanding of, of the uh, cosmos and uh, the universe keeps going on. New ideas will, will hopefully be um, formulated as our technology increases. So that just gives you an overview, a very brief overview of some of the um, scientists who have led to our understanding of the universe. I hope you found that interesting and we'll be delving a little deeper into some of these um, scientists later on in this course. Well, thank you for watching and I look forward to you joining me again. Bye for now.